All right, welcome back to the channel, or welcome if you're new. I've got a uh, couple very small updates for the uh, Bullzot deck, the Tevesh uh, Rogrok deck here, and uh, then I've got some gameplay for you. So it won't get, it won't take too long to talk about the updates. Here are the changes from the last video. Uh, Gorilla Shaman left in order to make room for pains here. Uh, basically, the idea is here that uh, we're going to try to get a um, source of card drawing going early. This is another way that we can do that. And by doing so, we'll draw into more artifact removal um, rather than running more artifact removal. Uh, so, you know, you can run a deck with uh, 50, I don't know, Vandal Blasts, or you could run a deck with, uh, say, half. Vandal Blasts and half card drawing, and what you'll find is in the deck with the half Vandal Blasts and half card drawing, you'll draw more Vandal Blasts than you need, and you'll feel like you have way too many, and then the deck with 50, you'll uh, you'll draw, you know, just the right amount, assuming you're in some environment where you need to constantly Vandal Blast, until you run out, and then you'll go, oh, geez, I, I, oh, I drew a land, shoot, I'm out of luck, right? So, it's the same concept here, we're going to cut the number of artifact removal, even despite the fact that artifact removal is so important increase the amount of card draw, and by that, hopefully get actually more uh, card draw running, uh, more, uh, rather, artifact removal running when we need it. And now, this does make us a little bit weaker to early artifacts, but outside of uh, the zero drops, which are pretty important to kill, which Gorilla Shaman was in there for, um, we cannot really kill a soul ring early, typically, with a Gorilla Shaman, so losing this um, to, you know, replacing this guy sitting in play waiting for us to get three mana to you to soul ring with a pain seer who might draw um, a, a uh, shattering spree or something like that quicker uh, kind of made a lot of sense all right so the other change was just i had phyrexian arena uh, it's now dark tutelage um, basically what i'm trying to do is the card we really want is black market connections that's the card we're waiting for as soon as this card gets released online in a i, I assume it's going to be in a pre-con or whatever i'm just going to go buy it if you look at the uh, store here um, what you'll see is the pre-con that you need to purchase it is just not here uh, so it, it just doesn't exist online it's very uh, it's very frustrating to have a discrepancy between the online playable commander set and the um, offline playable commander set um, but with that in mind uh, there's not really much I can do about it so if you have black market connections uh, that is this is the card slot Neither of these cards would uh, will, will make the cut. This is the card you really want, BMC, Black Market Connections, but uh, it's just not available. So I swapped over from Arena to Tutelage to just more closely emulate the primary role that BMC plays in this deck. But to be honest, um, the card draw is, is, is right up there, probably equivalent to mana production, which the Black Market Connections provides. And um, that's what makes this so frustrating because um, Dark Tutelage does not give us mana production except for by finding more mana. And uh, Black Market Connections could do both. Um, and so there really is no substitute. Also, uh, Black Market Connections is a controlled damage. I mean, you're always going to take one, two, uh, three, four, five, or six, depending on how you uh, divide it up, but it's your choice. Whereas Dark Tutelage is uh, random. Sometimes you take no damage, sometimes you take. You know, maybe six, sometimes you take five, four, three, two, one, whatever. So uh, it's a little bit more random. Um, ultimately, I think Black Market Connections will do more damage over the course of a game if you're selecting, depending on how you're making your choices. Uh, but then when it starts to become a problem, you can reduce it to a guaranteed steady trickle of one. Whereas uh, with Dark Tutelage, um, with Dark Tutelage, you don't have that option. Um, overall, I would say. Black Market Connections does slightly increase the risk over a Dark Tutelage, in just in the sense that, um, just in the sense that uh, the average CMC of this deck is so low that Dark Tutelage typically would do less damage than the BMC would. But if you've got a Black Market Connections running long enough to where that's a concern, you've won the game because you've had a Black Market Connections running that long. That's the theory, and it's the reason why this deck doesn't have any life gain. It just you have 40 life to work with and you use your life as a resource to end the game before it matters and in worst case scenario a scenario where you know you've you've gotten way ahead your opponents you're winning but you're, you're dying to like mana crypt and tap mana vault and black market connections and stuff well you've got smokestack to eat your own permanence and you can do other things like kill your own artifacts and stuff sacrifice your 
your crypt to your Doretti and things of that nature. So it's not hopeless. You can stop the bleeding at some point if you need to, generally speaking, in games like that. The main thing to keep track of is how much you ad nauseum for and realizing that your life is a resource. So I typically will stop ad nauseum um, if I'm if I play it early, I'll typically stop uh, drinking off the card pool. As soon as I get a hand where um, I can do enough powerful things, I have enough mana ramp and disruption and, and whatever is in that hand, to, to give me an overwhelming advantage, you don't need to win the game with it. You definitely don't, you shouldn't try to, because you won't for the most part. Um, but in reality, you will. It's just that when I say win the game, I don't mean like end, you know, closing the game out on the spot, right? So don't, don't necessarily look for like the best of the best when it comes to what you could be getting. If you're looking at the board and saying, "Wow, as soon as I, if I just draw enough mana sources off this ad nauseum, you know, I can just mind twist or death cloud my opponent for the win," um, and you're overlooking the fact that you could just dump a ton of artifacts into play and then maybe make some value plays and set your opponent so far behind that you'll, you'll get around to doing those other things later, uh, then you, you, you can actually over, over Nas or over Necro in this deck, um, same, same. So uh, just, just watch it, because your life is a resource and you can spend it frivolously and actually cost yourself a game. I think one of these games today you'll see I almost do exactly that. And then lastly, Snow-Covered Swamps become Phyrexian Tower. Now this puts my mana in a pretty... Um, pretty tenuous predicament in some sense. There are only four fetchable lands in this deck, and there are how many How many fetch lands? Uh, six, eight, something like that. So you can easily run out of fetch targets. There's uh, one mountain, one swamp, one um, dual land, uh, and one uh, coming to play tap, one pay, you know, uh, pay two life dual land, basically, right? So there are four targets, that's it. No more. Um, everything else, uh, so if you have fetches and you have burnt through all your, your targets, uh, you won't be able to fetch anything. But you can still use the cards. So you can use the cards to feed a smokestack. You can feed them to a dust bowl. You can tap them for mana with an Urborg. So there's at least three different ways that you can continue to use uh, fetch lands. Even if you're in that situation, of course, they can be thrown away to like a Mox Diamond. You can pitch them to a Death Cloud. So there's, there's things you can do with that. Um, so you can throw them away to Liliana. Sometimes you just hold them, you don't play them, and you just pitch them to Liliana. So uh, keep that in mind, but uh, don't don't sweat it, but be very careful about how you manage. Um, anytime that you can leave both colors of mana in your deck for future fetches, you want to try to do that. So like your first fetch, maybe you go get, um, maybe you go first turn uh, fetch land, and then end of their turn, you crack it, and you go get your blood crypt. And then the second turn you play a fetch land, you don't go get your badlands if you can help it. Go get a uh, basic swamp or mountain. That way you're leaving a dual land in there so that if you draw another fetch land of the same color, you're not out of gas, right? You still have a target. Now, the idea behind playing such a low quantity is that we're playing so many lands that have strong uh, effects that we want, that we're willing to take the risk. And the reason for that is because um, the games end so fast that the chances of you fetching out all of your lands and just having nothing, provided you're paying attention, like I just said, those chances are very low, and uh, it's, I think, generally worth the risk. If I could add one more land, it would be a swamp, and if I could add two more lands, it would be probably two swamps, actually, uh, before I would add, I, I would just leave the one mountain. So that's what I would do if I could. Alternately, it might be the case that at some point, um, say, Grabbing Cairns becomes the snow land that comes into play tapped, or the cycling land that comes into play tapped, um, as a duel, as an extra duel. But for now, I'm not going down that road because, um, because I don't want anything coming into play tapped. Uh, speed is of the essence, and uh, every land that's in here is worth it. Even the tower, the tower is incredible, as you'll see. Uh, should have been here probably from the beginning, but uh, definitely in this version it just does a lot for the deck and uh, is excellent. So that's it for the intro. Let's take a look at the games. Um, there was one other thing actually before I jump into the games. I wanted to sorry I wanted to address one other thing. Um, somebody told me they were upset because they they went out and I, I guess they got the cards and paper and then they showed up to play a tournament and then they were like those cards are banned. You can't play those in one v one. Um, so let me be clear as to what format this is specifically targeting, right? This is basically on an online meta deck. Um, 
I, I, I don't know anything. I don't have any. I don't have these cards in paper. Okay, so I, I can't help you with paper. Uh, what I can tell you is I know people who play in tournaments who use the one v one deck list, and I know people who use the multiplayer deck list. This is the this is a legal deck using the multiplayer list with the intention of playing in one v one events. And you're like, why is that? Well, the reason is online. There are, there is a one v one format, but it is completely dead. This one guy uh, is he like floating a game, and he's going to float a game forever. Okay, so the one v one format, in my view, does not exist. This is not a real format. Okay, I'll give you a history of the format really quick, and I guess, and then we'll get into the games. the The deal with the one v one format is that, um, and this was something that we really couldn't discuss at the time. Um, I think it was a few years ago now. Um, I'm starting to, starting to blur. Um, I'm old. <laughs> but anyway, uh, a while back, uh, Brian Weissman uh, talked to me, and, and I, he and I had been having talks back and forth about really wanting to um, almost build our own format, potentially create a, a, a format where th that was actually balanced, right? A commander format that was more, much more balanced than what we saw as, a, as the imbalanced format the imbalanced multiplayer format. There were a lot of things that we didn't like about the list. Um, one of the things was just, for example, you've got something like Thassa's Oracle these days. I'll use this example. Thassa's Oracle's unbanned, and that can kill the entire table in on turn one, frankly. Uh, but, you know, it typically as early as maybe turn three. You can just instantly win the game, and there's almost nothing anyone can do about it. It's got to be a counter spell to, to not lose, right? And um, that's legal. But Coalition Victory, the uh, five, six, seven, eight mana card that requires you to have like one land of every color and a creature of every color, and, and that instantly kills the whole table, that card is banned. It's the most absurd, ridiculous thing that I've ever seen. The, the multiplayer list is not curated, and it is not curated correctly. And if you think it is, all you have to do is look at the example I just gave you. And is, is Coalition Victory a one-card combo? Well, no, it's not, because it actually requires you to have multiple different types of permanents in play for it to be a, a win con. It's actually a super expensive, super slow, impossible. To, I don't know if anyone's ever won with it, but near impossible to pull off a uh, card that uh, requires, like, it's like a six-card combo or something. You need, like, Sliver Queen and five lands or something, plus the card, plus the mana to play it ridiculous versus Stasis Oracle, which is a two card combo that you can play at instant speed in the two best colors uh, in the game. So, um, so uh, <clears throat> you can argue with me about which cards need to be on the ban list or which ones don't, that's fine. But to argue that the ban list is, you know, properly maintained, I, I'll have none of that. Now, um, now, having said that, so Brian and I were talking and we were talking about possibly I don't know, just doing something crazy and just like coming up with our own list and just trying it out and seeing if, for example, proposing it to the um, post it on um, like, I don't know, uh, you know, one of the websites online and saying like, hey, OK, everybody, every, everybody that plays with us who's interested, you know, like fans of the channel and stuff, join our games and we'll play according to these rules and let's just see how it works and then let's polish it. And then if we get a really good format and stuff then maybe we'll present it to the rest of the world as a potential alternate, a like kind of 1v1 oriented commander, where we're not competing with commander because commander is a multiplayer um, format. We're not intending to dethrone the, the, the Sheldon Mannery's, you know, commander list or anything. We're just going to take something and, and kind of tweak it for the format that we enjoy, which is 1v1 games. And so that was something we'd, we've talked about off and on over the years, frankly. Um, and at one point, Wizards, apparently somebody over there, reached out to Brian and said, hey, we're thinking of making a, a 1v1 so that we can run tournaments and stuff with Commander. And we've seen, you know, you've got a channel. We know you. We trust you. Do you have any input? And so Brian had chatted with me and um, about potential, like, you know, he was asking me about the, the theoretical 1v1 scenario that we had discussed. Um, Apparently, with the idea of feeding some of that input towards responding to this, I found out later, right? So, um, I, uh, so I, you know, anyway, anytime Brian uh, gives me a thought experiment, I'm almost always intrigued. Um, that's where this deck came from. As a matter of fact, he, he just said, hey, it was all because Brian said, hey, why don't we, um, 
you know, instead of complaining about how ridiculous decks like this are, why don't we see how ridiculous we can make it? And that was kind of a, the thought experiment that led to this deck um, that he and I worked on. So, you know, anytime he gives me like a thought experiment, in fact, that's how I got into Commander. He said, hey, what can you do with, what can we do in Commander to try to play a control game in a format that um, has unlimited, you know, resources in the command zone? Like, is it even possible? And, he was like, he was like, I've kind of started doing it, but you know, what's your take on it? And then, you know, that's how, in 2009, I got sucked into the format to, to begin with. So anyway, he proposes a thought experiment about like, a, like that we'd been discussing already with the one v one thing. But he wanted me to like really think about it. So see, so yeah, I'll think about it. So I gave him my feedback, and um, eventually, and uh, he apparently, I, I found this out, you know, I, I, you know, in hindsight or whatever. But I, I guess he had. A lot of insight and they had asked him essentially as a um, almost like hey we're gonna take your ideas we're gonna put them into play well what actually happened with the 1v1 format uh, that sucks by the way uh, so the story behind it is that uh, the 1v1 format they took Brian's ideas um, and then they blended them with who knows whose ideas over at Wizards somebody who was a commander player and just had like a pet project or a concern or whatever I guess they couldn't break off. I guess the other person was worried about allowing certain cards because, or banning certain cards because um, that player was thinking from a multiplayer perspective and not, despite the fact that this was a 1v1 format, they couldn't get it out of their head that it was a 1v1 format and they were thinking about it with information that would make more sense in the multiplayer format. For example, that person thought Moat should be banned. Moat, a card that I haven't seen played, I've played it like maybe. I don't know, a decade ago? I haven't seen anyone play Moat, right? Like, who, who plays Moat, right? They thought Moat should be banned and a bunch of other stuff. So anyway, what ends up happening is they take Brian's ideas, which are based on our experiences from playing, from playing, I don't know, countless hours, tens of thousands of hours in games, and, and like hundreds of thousands of hours of experience in this game, and applying all that towards a, a, a proper 1v1 list, they took that, threw out whatever they didn't like from the list and made them le made those cards legal, then added a bunch of crap to the list that they didn't like and made those cards illegal and then proposed a ban list. Well, the 1v1 format opened up, people were excited, a bunch of people joined, there were tournaments, and then people realized that it, had, it was flawed. So um, Brian went back to them and said, hey, look, we got to fix this. It's obviously flawed. The tournament results show it's flawed. People are, you know, frustrated. You can see, like, w certain strategies are completely dominant. And he's like, again, I'm telling you, these are the fixes you need to make. Take these off the list because they don't need to be there. And put these things on because they do. What did they do? Completely ignored him. Took, like, one suggestion from him. None of the rest added a bunch more. They looked at what they thought the problem was with the format and added, like, a bunch more cards to the ban list. The ban list for the 1v1 format grew to the point that it was almost like 60 cards or 70 cards. It just grew and grew and grew and grew and grew. It grew out of control as whoever was on the other end was like trying to patch up holes in a sinking ship. And the way that they were patching it up is they would say, hey, there's a hole in that, in that wall over there in the ship. And they'd take a shotgun and blow a hole in this wall and then take the, take the rubble and stuff it into the hole from the other one. And so they were just making things worse and worse and worse to the point that the format degenerated down because they had banned fast mana, which punishes blue and rewards and rewards uh, green, and they and a bunch of other changes that they made that made no sense, um, crushing all these control tools and all these other things. And they banned the format down to the point that it was um, basically mono blue versus mono green was the format. It was, you would have decks with like 60 plus counter spells and decks with just nothing but like one drops that could get underneath counter spells and anti counter cards like carpet of flowers and and creatures that can't be countered and stuff and that was like the majority of the format right now I did very well in one v one incidentally uh, you can actually look up um, let me see if we can look up my um, let's see if we can look up my uh, statistics here I think if you take a look uh, yeah I haven't updated this in a very long time but I have a a deck list hiding out here and if you take a look here at my competitive results in uh, November so this is you know this is five years ago I figure we can talk about it now um, but if you take a look at the results um, what you'll see is that I got 
I did very well. 5-0, 5-0, 5-0, 5-0, 4-2, 3-3, 4-2, 5-0, 4-1. And on and on and on. Uh, and on and on and on and on and on. So that is a that is a lot of wins. These are all my wins with the Brea deck. So the Brea deck, which is obviously I was piloting to success, was designed to be mono blue and mono green. So guess what? Did very well. And then occasionally I'd run into players who were um, uh, very hard into a particular route, like a particular strategy that didn't comport with mono blue or mono green typically. And, uh, you know, you could say I would have some trouble or, like, for example, they'd be combo or whatever. And uh, those players would generally not win their event. They would generally lose to mono blue if they were combo or they'd lose to mono green if they were aggro. Um, but they could sometimes beat the Brea deck because they were super focused and Brea had to divide its weapons between, you know, mono blue, which is very one, which is very much one style of sort of offense and defense and control, and mono green, which is very much another. And another example of that is you can see, look at the price of the deck with the wins uh, online in tabletop, right? 2,000 bucks, 2,500 bucks in Magic Online, you know, 500, but 2,500 bucks here. And then you can see the price goes up and up and up. And you can see we get some losses and have to make some adjustments and the price goes up and then we go back to winning. And now the dang deck costs $6,500. It's almost, it's doubled and then and then 50%, you know, half again, uh, as high as it used to be now online the price was about the same because Magic Online prices are kind of cool like that. But in terms of, um, in terms of uh, real world values, you can understand how much more difficult it got to uh, continue to maintain the same wins. Uh, you can see you had to pour money on the problem, basically. So that's kind of what happened with, uh, and I guess if you're curious, I'll, I'll show you the old, um, yeah, you can see the, uh, the mix. This is, I mean, Grizzle brand wasn't banned, right? <laughs> like it's just so insane. So, uh, yeah, just, just crazy. Um, here's the uh, last deck list that uh, I was recorded to have played in the 1v1 list. Yeah, now current tabletop value for this deck, $10,000. Magic Online, 286. So, play. You, you wonder why I have no cards and why I play online? Well, first of all, my collection was stolen a long time ago. Secondly, um, yeah, I, as a dad, I can afford 290 bucks for, for Magic. Not uh, ten grand, unfortunately. Even doing all right in life, I still can't. I, j I just can't, you know. So here you can see kind of what the deck ended up as. I'm um, very familiar, I think, for most people that uh, may may have um, basically watched some of the earlier videos. We can run cruise and dig through time. Something you wouldn't normally see. Armageddon is in the deck, right? Like this deck was, like I said, very much focused, very specifically these cruise and dig. Extreme and Armageddon extremely good against uh, mono blue, but also um, solid against green uh, for different reasons, treachery and stuff like that. Um, yeah, just a very different, just a very different time. But that's the uh, oop, let's get out of that. So that's the story of the one v one format. In my view, ultimately at the end of the whole experiment, the Wizards concluded this is it was falling apart. People have lost interest. Tournaments weren't firing, and they threw up their hands and they said. One v one is just going to be the same list as uh, multiplayer. Basically, there's no difference. The formats are the exact same. And then they decided to ban a couple of cards in one v one. A couple things that were a little broken, like partners, which is uh, something I've been saying is a problem for a very long time. Partners, of course, not being banned in multiplayer because multiplayer is a different world. But partners are banned in one v one. Well, not exactly banned. Um, what it is is you can play with a partner, but you can't play with a partner to the partner. So, for example, in one v one, I could load up this deck, and it would only allow me to pick one of these as my commander, not both. Uh, that's the way that works. <coughs> Which is uh, <clears throat> a little heavy-handed. I still like my solution better of shared commander text between the two. But well, whatever. Anyway, <clears throat> the point is, um, 1v1 now exists in a f format that, as far as I'm concerned, is not real. It's not real. Uh, I, I wouldn't consider this to be the gold standard of anything. Uh, I don't think this format, frankly, is supported much. It, it hasn't had any updates to it. Uh, they never listened. They Ultimately, they never listened to Brian, and uh, the experiment went to crap. And uh, of course it would, because you're literally going against somebody who has one of the smartest and most experienced magic players in the world who is devoting countless time, amount of time into this. 
um, and then um, and had had backup of uh, you know other people from his channel, myself, anyone who was who had been contributing to uh, just the conversation in general, which in ge just generally making him smarter, even if they didn't know that they were feeding into that all that feed feedback directly, but just the comments and thinking there all kind of coming together, and they ruined it, they ignored it, and destroyed the format. So. Uh, now, why, do I, why am I bringing that? Well, it's because one of the viewers of my channel said, hey, this I built this deck and they wouldn't let me play in a tournament because they said it's not 1v1 legal. Well, I'm here to tell you I'm sorry that that happened to you. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, you, you maybe you can tell them this story, but the point is th uh, there's nothing wrong with playing the multiplayer list in a 1v1 setting. And to me it makes the most sense because the actual 1v1 list is bullshit, right? It's non-existent. It doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. Nobody plays it. It has no bearing on anything. And uh, every time at the, during that era, I actually got um, as a, a, a buddy of mine uh, basically gave me the minus some of the most expensive cards, most of the cards that I needed to play. Not um, Brea at the time, but um, like Oloro, because that's what I was playing way back when. And I actually showed up to, I showed up to play in paper at stores, and I would say, "Hey, I have a one v one according to the one v one list," and they'd be like, "What are you talking about?" <laughs> like it was so impossible to try to make the transition from online to offline for me. Um, I ultimately I just gave it up, but I gave up on the idea. But that's kind of my point. Um, you, you you can't really have that. In my view, there either needs to be there's two solutions here that are both acceptable. One is that the, the multiplayer list probably should account for 1v1 matches and be curated according, accordingly. What that would do is it would remove some of the, I guess, fun nonsense from multiplayer, like that's his Oracle combo. But, um, I, I guess that's fun, but it would um, add, but it would end, um, you would have certain cards banned in multiplayer that are banned for multiplayer reasons that don't have to be banned in 1v1, like... Darkside Extortionist. Darkside Extortionist, I don't think it's okay in 1v1, but, but most of the time, for every game you blow out with it, you have like three games that it does jack all. Um, whereas in multiplayer, it's complete ban, like it should have been banned yesterday. Like it's ridiculous that you can spend two mana and just generate like five, six, seven mana and just like win the game on the spot just because you have more opponents, right? The card is obviously proportionately powerful equal to the relative to the number of opponents you have. And when you have three of them, it's three times as good in multiplayer as it is in 1v1. That's too good. Card needs to be banned? Probably, right? Just too much mana. Um, in my view, right? In my view. And it's fine if you don't agree. That's that's okay. I'm not really intending to start a fight over a Dockside Extortionist. I'm just saying that's a good example of what I would see as a card that some collateral damage, if you have a shared ban list like multiplayer and 1v1, and you have a shared ban list, there'd be some collateral damage where multiplayer opponents wouldn't get to do cool stuff like uh, whatever, and uh, you know, that's historical, Jesus. And, uh, and uh, or I I example, Necropotence I think should be banned, Ad Nauseam should be banned. I've been saying this for a while. I think these cards are completely ban worthy. Um, in multiplayer, they're not as bad, I guess, in theory. Uh, but in 1v1, they're, they're horrible cards, horribly designed. Um, Ad nauseum is GG, like, basically always, as long as you're not stupid about it. It's always GG. Because you draw, like, 20, and nobody else can do anything about it because there's only one opponent. And that's not enough. In a group of three, maybe someone can punish you for that. But when it's just one, like, the whole table can turn on you at that point and, and maybe take you out. But 1v1, there's no way. So um, cards like that probably would have collateral damage if you had a shared ban list you'd ban them for 1v1 purposes and then in group play you wouldn't get to do stuff like that but frankly is group play really hurting that bad if you can't necropotence if you can't thassa's oracle if you can't ad nauseum i don't think so but you know that's just me um um and re in reverse 1v1 would have da collateral damage from the multiplayer list bands like uh, like uh, uh, Darkside Extortionist, for example. So that's kind of how I see things could go, and I would be okay with that. Or you could have a properly curated 1v1 list that, did, that wasn't BS. It wasn't just some pet 
employee wizards who just, I don't like moat. Like, what? Ah, humility's too good. Like, you're out of your mind, dude. Like, nobody's even playing these cards. It's not too good. It, it doesn't matter. They banned, like, Winter Orb. I don't like Winter Orb. And you're like, you're like, dude's comboing me out with, like, and the only way I can possibly stop this combo is to attack their mana and you're taking away Winter Orb, like, but, but limited resources is legal? Armageddon's legal? Like, I don't even understand the logic here, right? So the 1v1 list was garbage. It made no sense. Um, upheaval was legal, but, like, other things were... It, it was just dumb. Uh, but if you made a good list, a properly curated list, designed specifically for 1v1, and you separated it from multiplayer commander, I think that'd be great. And the multiplayer commander... Um, team can continue to make that the format that they want it to be and the 1v1 players the CEDH players Could really craft down and crack down on some of the worst stuff, but still leave some of the insanity, right? Because if you're a Hardcore 1v1 player you like a little bit of crazy, right? You enjoy a little bit of like soul ringy swingy stuff um, Perhaps but maybe you just don't want the whole format to be constantly about like maybe I want somebody gets races ahead with cards like that, then the other person has to try to fight their way back, as opposed to somebody races ahead with cards like that and then just instantly ends the game, right? It's that last part that makes it so frustrating for me. That's the part I think needs to go. Um, and we just got to figure out which cards that, that, that fit the bill, you know, for that. And then, you know, tweak accordingly, adjust accordingly. That's my view on it. <clears throat> However, um, what we are in now is a bit of a gray zone. So with all that said... If you're going to play this list, understand you're using the multiplayer list in a deck designed for 1v1 because the 1v1 list is crap. But if I had my way, the 1v1 list would mirror the multiplayer list at a minimum, just to avoid confusion like that, for starters, and then ideally break off and becomes its own animal or have a shared playlist. Uh, I don't have my way though. That is up to all of us as a community to make that happen. So that's kind of where we're at with that. So be aware, if you want to make this deck and you want to go compete at a tournament, you need to confirm with them first. You know, <clears throat> are we using the multiplayer list or are we using the weird 1v1 list that only exists uh, in the uh, in the empty echoing hallways of the 1v1 open playroom of Magic Online. So if we're not using that list, <clears throat> this list is legal. And as far as I know, I've got buddies who are running, in fact, I do know, I've got buddies who are running tournaments or, run, or playing in tournaments where they run it 1v1, break the top eight, just a classic 1v1 tournament, but they use the multiplayer list. And, you know, so <clears throat> I'm kind of building to, I, I text them and try to give them my updates and help them because I'd like to see them succeed. And I'd like to see you succeed. So check with your store, find out what the rules are, build accordingly. Uh, if you are going to take this into a multiplayer environment, the deck needs to change. It would work to some degree, but 100%. You're probably going to need to run them as I was just saying because games are going to go long and you'll run out of life. And uh, you'll probably need to run uh, Darkside Extortionist because it's absolutely ridiculous in 1v1. And there may be some other changes that you might need to make. I don't know. I'm not a multiplayer specialist. I hate political wrangling. I hate arguing over who can attack who and who should destroy what. And I, I hate that stuff. I don't want to play Magic like that ever. It's a nightmare to me. I have no interest in it. And I am, am I have no heartburn with people that do. Um, but I just stay out of their world as much as possible. Um, but as far as Commander goes... When it comes to the the uh, sort of overall, like what is the what is the actual rule set we're using? Their rule set is controlling my play currently, unfortunately, um, because we haven't formally broken off into a, a viable one v one list, or um, because you know this, or we don't ha have uh, any consideration for one v one taking place when they make ban decisions. All right. With all that said, we've talked about the changes, talked about the philosophy, we've talked about all that. I didn't realize this intro is going to be so long. But uh, <clears throat> now you know the history a little bit behind that format and why it sucked, why it started out so hopeful and ended up sucking so bad. Um, uh, and it was just whoever that employee was making those decisions. Uh, so it goes. All right, let's get into some games now. I have um, losses, wins, and draws all turned on. As you can see, in the last seven days... Um, You'll see that I've had, you know, a few losses here and there. I, I took a couple losses. I'm a donkey on the 16th. 
<coughs> Excuse me. I got uh, a couple losses here. Guy Fieri ball on the 16th as well. Uh, McDonk took me out um, a couple times. I had a couple other losses. Uh, I want to say, yeah, there's one to Guy Fieri ball. A couple wins afterwards. One to Super Delphin. Um... Super Delphin again, actually. Very interesting. A uh, couple of losses. Let's see. One to Darth Crixus. Dan, uh, Dan uh, Pesce, 94. Colossum took me out in, in a game. I had Dan Pesce, uh, 94 again in a game. A couple wins and then a loss. DJ Ice, 77. Dan Pesce, 94 again. Showing up to uh, torment me with victories. JK, 22. Pros and Cliffhanger. Although, you know, you can see I get some wins afterwards and such. Be wonders, so losses and wins. It's, it's it's all a mixed bag against these opponents, but you can see like there's a win against McDonk later on and such. Um, so what was happening is um, part of it is, uh, you know, they just beat me. Part of it is that I was experimenting. I had a lot of funky changes in here, uh, a lot of things that uh, currently aren't in here um, because I'm a, I'm a heavy experimenter and I'm willing to take losses to try new ideas and see why they're bad or why they don't work. And uh, so ultimately I, I ended up with this version of the deck and then how did that do? Well, I haven't played against enough of those folks yet, but today in initial testing over the last few hours, I picked up 10 wins, and I thought there were some interesting games in here, so I thought I'd run through them, and hopefully you've stuck around or skipped ahead to this point, because now we're going to get into some games, and we'll see what you think about the changes. <clears throat> there may be one card, there's always one card I'm floating around in the experimental slot. In this version, the experimental slot is the um, is the one that I I can't fill with the correct card. The correct card is Black Market Connections. Once again, I've mentioned this uh, a few times, uh, and I will mention it again. That is the card that we want here. It just does not exist online. This card is uh, at the beginning of your pre-combat main phase. Choose one or more. Create a treasure. Draw a card. Create a creature. And uh, each one of them has a life total associated with it. You do have to do at least one. Um, this card is meant to replace Dark Tutelage, um, but for the day, and it exists in one of the Baldur's Gate precons, it doesn't, it's not being sold in stores uh, online yet. It's very frustrating to have that split between what you can do in paper and what you can do online. Um, so in, my buddies are playing with it in paper and telling me it's great, and I'm like, well, I'd, I sure love to uh, get that experience, wizards, you know, hello, I've got money, do you want my money? It's like, geez. So anyway, uh, in the meantime, though, you'll see that card kind of floats through these games as I think I tried Phyrexian Arena, I tried Gorilla Shaman, tried a couple of other things, nothing too crazy. Um, if it plays a role, um, we'll point it out, but in general, I think in every game it would have been better as Black Market Connections, though, I'm pretty sure. So, all right, we're going to run through these games now. So this is game one against Masa Viciano, 1993. And uh, I don't know that everyone, sometimes people just concede when they... they they see this deck or when, when the deck starts out. You can see opponents playing Zuri, Renegade Leader. I've got a hand here. This is, in my view, going second. This is not a keepable hand. Um, you love to have first turn Ragavan, second turn attack, get a treasure, play your confidant and stuff. But this is playing against green. I'm going second. They're going to have blockers before I can get that in play. I'll have to put my only land on red. This is very slow, and there's no way to play my commander by turn three. And the rule for this deck if you haven't heard me say this before, is that if your hand does not show you a path to getting your commander in play by turn three, then your hand is not keepable. I don't care what else it does, um, with very, 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 very few exceptions. Um, maybe you play it hundreds of games and you'll get a feel for the exceptions, but this is definitely not a keepable hand, so we'll mulligan this uh, shortly. All right, again, you know, look, I got Priest of Forgotten Gods. I've got Deluge against Green. This is good. I've got a couple mana sources. Crucible, I can I can ramp my hand up. Put the God Pharaoh statue away. This is a solid hand. Doesn't play my commander by turn three. Not keepable. Although, in theory, it does because you can tap this for two black. So one, two, three, four mana. So all I would need is a land and, like, another creature. In theory, but those things aren't in my hand. Without those in my hand, I can't guarantee I'll get that. So that's not a keepable hand either. It is much better to mulligan with this deck then it is to keep a hand that doesn't do what you need it to do. This hand can play the commander by turn two, actually. So this is definitely a keepable hand. We can stop mulliganing. Just got to figure out what to put back. So here I'm going to go ahead and throw back the Thoughtseize. I'm going second. 
more than likely, um, I, my first turn is going to be Vampiric Tutor. So by the time I get to the Thoughtseize, most of the early good stuff, like Sylvan Library and uh, Soul Ring and stuff, are already on the table. So I'm going to throw the Thoughtseize away and play a board control game, not as much a hand control, against a green deck, which is a, b a board-based strategy, not so much a hand strategy. Um, attacking your hand is a lot less important than getting on the board. So I can throw that away. And for the very same reason, I can throw a him to Torok. And what this does is it means that if, if my opponent does lead off with like a soul ring or whatever, or runs out some uh, artifacts that are a problem, I have a way to deal with those um, as well as a way to deal with creatures via the Priest of Forgotten Gods. So I can actually kill artifacts, creatures, get lots of mana, get my commander going. This is a very acceptable hand. Going first, it would be much better. But my opponent has a slow start. So I will lead off with Verdant. Play Rogue, always play your commander on turn one, unless you are planning to Toxic Deluge specifically. Always play your commander on turn one, because you don't know if the next card I draw is, uh, for example, Curse of Opulence. I'd be very sad if my commander wasn't in play. All right, so opponent on their turn plays Elvish Warmaster. Elvish Warmaster makes 1-1 one, one tokens whenever other elves enter the uh, battlefield. Um, but it only triggers once per turn, so it won't trigger on itself. And it can also uh, kind of over do like a mini overrun. All right, so nice and slow start from my opponent helps because my start is a little slow. I'm going to grab Badlands here and Vamp. And I'm going to go ahead and grab the turn two commander, I believe is what I'm going for. Yep, via Lotus. So that's how you get your commander on turn two um, whenever you have a opening Vampiric or Imperial Seal, if you want to. All right, we're going to get Tevesh Zat, fix our mulligan immediately. And uh, pass for the turn. Great. Game on. Now we have a real game. Opponent plays their commander, gets a uh, token, and gets to trip away at Tevesh Shazad a little bit. Uh, for my turn, I can, of course, make some blockers to protect my commander. I'm going to Demonic Tutor here and go prep for um, what I know needs to be done soon. And I'll go ahead and get a uh, tapped crypt. So what I want to do is clear the board with Deluge and then follow up with Priest and uh, put him in a, in, a, in a pretty tough spot there. All right, so for my opponent's turn, they uh, play a Kicked Draga Warcaller, which is going to act like a, um, it's going to produce a token and also act like a Crusade. So all of my all of my opponent's creatures are pretty burly, and uh, th thankfully I have these blockers here so I can keep my Tevesh alive. So we'll go ahead and double block. If my opponent hadn't done that, and they did not attack for lethal, I would single block, and then I would leave this in place so that I could eat it and draw some cards and then clear the board. But here I have to double block or else Tevesh dies. So don't be afraid to let Tevesh Sazat tank for, for himself or for you, like take some hits in order to draw more cards. Um, you don't always have to chump block, like double chump, but of course there you do if it's going to kill him. You, you have to, obviously. All right, so we'll go ahead and play the, uh, make the uh, big play. Now I could play, do it for two life there because as soon as two life kills the Draga Warcaller, the other creatures shrink and then um, die as a state-based effect, so two life was all I had to pay there. We'll go ahead and throw, despite the fact that he had multiple three threes, and pass for the turn. And for my opponent's turn, I'm hoping he does exactly that, just play his commander and pass. It's not great because, um, it's not great if I try to, if I do anything, if I'm not careful, basically, my opponent can um, uh, give, make this a 5-5 trampler and then start whacking Tevesh out pretty hard. So uh, I do want to take that off the board, but this is a lovely setup here where I can kill it with K Command and set up with Priest, and I'm in awesome shape. So before we do that, I did play a land there a little prematurely. I probably should have drawn some cards, uh, but I wanted to, I guess, make sure that they didn't have any... There are tricks you can play, zero mana uh, giant growth effects, so I'll go ahead and draw here. Find myself a Mox. That's pretty nice. I'm just going to... I'm just going to go ahead and... Uh, mocks down and eat that duress as i said i i don't believe in general like my opponent has two cards left um so i'm actually going to pause here and take a time out from the uh from the priest of forgotten gods plan and go ahead and just use the duress to fuel a mind twist to take the last two cards out of their hand and put them into top decking mode and then we'll follow up with the priest so very nice i get rex age and uh and a expensive card, so Rex Age, oh, it's nice to see. I didn't actually have any targets for them, which is funny, because this deck's loaded with them. Opponent draws for the turns, has no play and passes. If they played, like, just a dorky elf or whatever, then we just follow up with Priest, 
car and we make some guys, we chump block, he plays a guy, we start tapping priest. Green can't beat uh, active priest of forgotten gods, uh, no chance. A lot of decks actually would lose from that scenario. So we move on to game two. Game two is against, or game two for the day, it's against Rainbow Pups. And I am cooking, I'm sorry. But it, it's Hawaii and it is too hot here for this. I'm not trying to do a uh, sexy time stream or whatever. Hopefully nobody's offended by um guy walking around with no shirt on. Anyway, um, I hardly meet the uh, <laughs> standard for that sort of stream. All right, anyway, uh, so Rainbow Pops had to mulligan to six. Let's see if I can fix, get a little closer and get the sound good. Oh, God, I'm, I was just cooking. I'm trying to stay covered under the blanket just in case it bothered anybody, but at the end of the day, I've, I've got to, I'm starting to overheat here. All right, so I drew, so this is an interesting one because, um, this opponent's playing the Locust God as their commander. Um, that's really slow unless they get fast mana. I have no disruption for fast mana. I could go first turn Tevesh Sazat, but uh, my opponent's land actually comes into play tap, which means they could be holding this land in a soul ring. And because they might be holding a soul ring, or they could have a mana drain, I, uh, I need to Inquisition here, I think. I'm going to take a turn off the mana vault. I'll go with the Inquisition route, and then we'll see where we're at. Maybe I'll follow up with like Pain Seer on turn two. And then use Pains here to start drawing cards. And then on turn three, I'll play a land, uh, cast a Mana Vault, and cast my Commander. So turn three Commander means I can go ahead and take a turn off and just Inquisition them. So let's start with that. And look at that. Oof, Mana Vault. That could have been bad news. Now they are down to just Island Mountain Baral Serum Visions. This is, this is good. That was definitely the right choice for me there. And... Uh, now it's looking real good. I'm going to go ahead and play Rog, like I said, play him on turn one. We'll check off the Mountain, and we'll check off the Baral. All right, and I top deck a Mox Amber. That's lovely. So we'll get the Mox down, because now I can actually play the Mana Vault and play my Commander immediately. I can skip going with the Pain Seer route and just go straight to the Commander, and if you can do that, I mean, this is a turn two Commander backed up by Disruption. Uh, yeah, let's do that. And we'll go ahead and just draw three immediately. Boom. And look at this. This is just fantastic, right? So, very good stuff. Uh, let's see how the opponent uh, fares. For their turn, they play their Mountain. We'll check that off. Ponder rather than Serum Visions. I think that's actually in the wrong order. I would have Serum Visions first and then Ponder personally, but I, I don't know. I, it could be argued either way. So, we can check that off. So, now we don't know what's in their hand. We just know that they have some cards and that uh, other instances of sorceries are discounted, but they actually haven't taken advantage of that yet, uh, which makes sense. This isn't their commander, so the whole deck wouldn't be built around us. Um, I definitely would like to get this off the board, though, because it's a mana source for them. Um, it's not my first priority or anything. All right, so what I'm going to do for the turn, first I'm going to make some thralls. Uh, secondly, I'm going to ask my opponent to sacrifice a creature. This was done out of order. I should have asked my opponent to sacrifice a creature first, um, the only reason is that if they had some sort of deflection effect, um, then they could deflect it back to me and I'd sack a Thrall, but if the Thralls aren't in play, they'd deflect it back to me and I'd sack nothing. Um, how that works is that this card is modal. It has three modes, right? Artifact, Creature, and Planeswalker. Once you put it in a mode like this, the one that's highlighted, if they were to bounce that back at me with like a deflecting swap, the mode um, does not change, so they can't bounce it back and then tell me to sack a Planeswalker. It doesn't work that way. So, uh, you know, my opponent right here could play a Red Ritual and then Deflecting Swap for two mana off of Baral. And uh, I would have to sacrifice the creature, so I should have uh, made this play before, make, uh, before making the tokens. That's, that's all I'm saying. Not that I would mind such a play from my opponent, but, you know, just if you want to be perfect, which we want to try to be as perfect as we can in our gameplay, that was less than optimal, so I just want to point that out when it happens. I'll go ahead and play a land here, and then I'm um, going to go ahead and follow up with a creature. So the reason I play Pain Seer is Dark Confident will start drawing the next turn. Pain Seer is two turns away for the uh, refueling. And so I'm going to play the Pain Seer first because it's just a smidge slower to get me my cards. And uh, so I want to get that I want to get that rolling so that I'm, I can start drawing. And also it's a bit of bait. Uh, Confidant's slightly better than Pain Seer. Uh, not once it gets going, but only in the fact that Painseer can, if they put a blocker out, I, I have to stop attacking and I don't get any more cards with it. 
Um, so if they do like kill the pain seer here, then the dark confidant's probably a good follow up. So versus doing it in the other order. All right, so they're just digging and digging visions of beyond. I haven't seen that in a long time. This is super ambitious card. Obviously, if you get to a point where this is good, it's crazy good. One blue draw three cards instant. Uh, I heard I heard that card's good. But uh, the problem with it is that if a graveyard does have 20 or more cards in it, um, for the most part, uh, there's no, there's no, uh, like, there's no game where that should ever be true. So this card should never actually be good because no game should go long enough to have 20 cards in the graveyard. Not in a format where you would actually need the kind of power that this provides. And then my opponent makes the horrible play of tapping two mana and saying go. This is clearly somebody coming from the multiplayer scene because this is like a thing apparently that they do in multiplayer online culture that I absolutely despise. And I, I mentioned to him like this is just a really bad habit and you probably should break it. Um, for what it's worth, right? Anyway, I just uh, draw off a Tadesh. And uh, very nice. Get, get some more land drops. So go ahead and play the um, Workshop. I'm going to clamp down on their mana. Thanks for tapping all your mana, dude. Just I, I feel bad, but at the same time, hopefully the lesson sticks. Hopefully this you know, made my opponent feel the pain, and then they won't make that mistake. I mentioned to them specifically they could use F6 key to uh, skip without having to do what they just did. Anyway, I'll go ahead and play Karn here. That way, if they draw like a Crypt under the Winter Orb and try to get out of this box, it's not going to be quite so simple. I'm going to go ahead and pack with, attack with Paints here, and then I'm going to play Dark Confidant because it's very hard to sweep the board. Not impossible. They go land uh, Paraclasm or something. But realistically, with cards that my opponent might be running, it's very hard for them to sweep the board um, under the uh, Winter Orb in this position, so I'll go ahead and um, overcommit, and I can Vampiric Tutor later. I'm going to place a tap plan. It's just so brutal for them. All right, so now we get uh, Dark Confidant feeding us, uh, Painseer, or Mana Vault dinging us, Painseer feeding us, still the upkeep, and now I can Vampiric Tutor in response, and I'll go ahead and take a God for a statue, because I, I just want to lock this game down. Um, I don't quite have enough mana. I'm a little shy. So I can make Mana Vault a creature because I, Mana Vault's hurting me. And the reason I make Mana Vault a creature here is that if my opponent does play a board sweeper, I want Mana Vault to die also because I'm never going to untap it with the orb. And uh, that just takes away a, dam a source of damage to me. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and play the uh, Talisman here. And I'm very close. I'm sitting on Deflecting Swat. And very close to the uh, God Pharaoh statue here. I'm going to go ahead and play Rog with the colorless mana, the, the, the artifact mana here, because that's not going to hurt me under the Winter Orb. It's just taking advantage of maximizing my mana utility. My opponent draws for the turn and gives up. I mean, I'm drawing five cards per turn. I, probably worth uh, conceding at this point. Had they not, given that I have the SWAT and the statue, you know, I would untap the, um, the workshop and all this mana over here, play this statue, SWAT away any counterspell that they have, and um, win the game with just what we see here, not even needing to, uh, not even considering uh, what else I might have seen over those, all the cards that I would have drawn. All right, next is Ranks 0213. Rank 0213 is playing, and we have a, a, a set against this opponent. And Rank 0213 is playing um, Sithis Harvest's Hand. I have seen this commander come up. I don't really like it that much. Um, I don't think it's great, um, but it's not bad. It, it isn't, so, you know, it's, so it's good, right? It's just not great. Um, it's good because uh, commander should do, there are three things that your commander should do. Make mana, make cards, or kill or disrupt your opponent, right? Um, Sithis does a very good job of producing mana, and, uh, excuse me, of producing cards, and uh, it's cheap as anything. Given that it's just two mana, um, it's very interesting to have a card drawing engine that only costs two mana. I mean, look at my card drawing engine. It costs five. Like, I'll never get that thing into play, right? <laughs> anyway, so uh, what I don't like about it is uh, it doesn't take advantage of Guild Lotus at all. Um, uh, it's Jeweled Lotus, rather. And Lotus is one of the most broken cards in the entire format. Uh, and there's a few other things that I don't really like about it. Mostly the color combination is not that great. And the requirement to have enchantments, it doesn't draw a card independently. So it's a card drawing engine waiting to happen versus a card drawing engine, a self, a self uh, 
sort of licking ice cream cone over here with the with the with the uh, commander that actually draws, you know, produces his own creatures to sacrifice and draw cards. Anyway, in the meantime, I've got this hand here. Uh, this uh, does not follow any of the rules, right? Like, this does not make a, well, it doesn't follow the number one rule. It doesn't make a turn three, turn three to Veshtas out. So this has got to be a mulligan. This hand might. There's a couple different routes that this hand could make a turn three to Veshtas out. So we're going to keep this and just figure out what we want to throw back. Um, this one's a really hard one. I want to throw back to Embrith Shieldbreaker. It's the weakest card here, and um, and uh, my opponent is unlikely to be playing significant numbers of artifacts. Surely they're playing like Sol Ring and Crypt, but outside of that, right, maybe Mox Diamond, you know, the usual suspects, but probably not a ton because they're an enchantment deck. So you're going to expect to see more things like Fertile Ground and Rampant Growth or Wild Growth and stuff like that um, instead of a bunch of artifacts like I've got. But I do have it in conjunction with the Liquid Metal Torque, which means this is just destroy target permanent for a red and a colorless. You know, you tap this instead of using colorless, you tap this for a red and boom, like uh, Citrus or whatever, um, including enchantments, right? Like there could be enchantments that are problematic for me. So with that in mind, and the fact that Smokestack is just a win con, especially early, which I can potentially get it down early. Uh, with that in mind, I'm probably going to have to throw away, and I need my mana, so it's going to have to be Confidant or Painseer. Between the two, Painseer is just a little bit weaker than Confidant, so that's the one that I'm going to go ahead and choose to mulligan. Sadly, though, because I'd love to get them both in play and just have that crazy engine running. And <coughs> excuse me. And if um, if uh, my um, I, I didn't require a mulligan, there's a very real possibility, thanks to the power of Phyrexian Tower, that I could have got them both running very quickly. Um, but, uh, no, we'll have to take that mulligan, and then I'm going, luckily my opponent also mulligans down, which helps a little bit. And also, more importantly, I think, I'm going first, which means that I have a chance to, I have to actually make a decision on how I want to run out the first turn, because two options, one is I can go, sorry, three options here. One, play the Arid Mesa, pass, and then sack and get my tap land at the end of their turn. Two, play the Phyrexian Tower, sack my rogue now, and make, uh, Dark Confidant, uh, in order to start drawing card right away, as soon as my next turn starts. Three, play the tower, sack it, and you get the Torque. If I go with the Torque route, then on the next turn, I can play a land, tap two mana, and um, play the uh, Dark Confidant pretty easily. Or, um, or I could, uh, well, I mean, yeah, yeah. Or I could potentially play a land, cast the Liquid Metal Torque, Sorry, the liquid metal torque would be in play, uh, so I could play a land and uh, activate the torque, targeting one of their permanents, um, and then eat it with the Ember's Shield Breaker. Like I could destroy target permanent, and there's a chance that, well, non-land permanent, there's a chance that they might have something in play that I need to kill. So that gives me a little more flexibility there. Um, but ultimately, I decide that the route I want to take is uh, I'm going to go this route. Also, by getting extra mana in play, it would set me up for the possibility of earlier smokestack. And the sooner you get smokestack down, the better. But at any rate, um, I decide that uh, the best route to take is the Confidant route against Green White, which is gonna struggle a little bit to kill creatures, possibly. And because um, this can feed me more um, cards, which so many of my cards make mana, that this can actually feed me more mana and ultimately result in, in allowing me to do more over the next few turns. Lastly, it's a creature, so in the event that I have some sort of mana emergency or a better play, like let's say let's say I flip over Necropotence and then like nothing significant, but I have a Necro, maybe I just play land, get a Black Source, tap this and eat my Confidant and turn him into a Necropotence instead. So with all that, the flexibility and the card draw, I'll take the uh, Confidant here. And then for my opponent's turn, they go first turn Utopia Sprawl. So now um, this forest now taps for both green and white. All right, so for my turn, we'll hit on Confidant. It gives me Calling the Weak. Very nice to have an extra creature in play. Thoughtseize. This is rough because I have, like, more that I want to do with sacrificing my creatures than I actually can do. Right, because I'd love to sack him for two black and then sack him to Calling the Weak, and, like, I can only do one or the other. And unfortunately, Rog costs two here. So if I spend two mana, I don't have mana for Calling the Weak. Um, you know, here's where if I had the Torque in play, it might have been nicer. I wouldn't have Thoughtseize, but I... I'd have to torque down, and then on this turn, I could um, cast Rog for two, and then sack him for four, and play like Smokestack, for example. 
Um, or I could eat, I could sack the confidant for calling the weak, and I can actually play Tavesh if I'm willing to give up a dark confidant. But that's a dark confidant. Am I really willing to do that? I could also smoke stack and thoughts use my opponent. I mean, there's just a lot of options here. So what is the best play here? I'll give you a moment. This is actually worth thinking about. I think very interesting. And then I'll show you what I did. All right, so first thing I did is just get in for damage because uh, no matter what, uh, this bought me time to think because no matter what I decide to do, um, if I leave him in play or sacrifice him, uh, I can do that after combat. But if I choose to sacrifice him, um, I, I should probably attack first. All right. So what I end up doing is I tap mana and I play Rog and pass. None of the above. I just prep and wait because now I've got access to four or five, six mana next turn, not counting whatever Dark Confidant finds. And if I can leave the Confidant in play, I think that's for the best. So my opponent plays Sithis, Harvest Hand again, and oh, yuck. You hate to see it. You hate to see it. Rancor. So they draw a card off Rancor. Now, if you don't know, whenever Rancor is put into a graveyard, it goes back to its owner's hand. Rancor was in a deck that I actually played at a Pro Tour qualifier back in the day um, that ran uh, back when Urza Saga was legal. And uh, it, uh, and uh, like Necro decks were around and stuff. And uh, I played four Rancors and four Smokestacks. And that was my combo. I would play Smokestack, I would eat my Rancor, and then just keep replaying Rancor over and over while my opponent's permanence dwindled down to nothing. And back then, Necro decks were super greedy. They had like lots of Dark Rituals, and, um, sorry, lots of uh, Drain Lifes and like Sengir Vampires as their top end and stuff. And um, and uh, it was an, actually a nightmare for them to face. I had fast mana, disruption. I could do a lot of damage with the Rancors to their face, which was bad news for Necro. And I could, uh, in green, I had um, Artifact Kill for their um, stuff. It was actually a great deck that beat the Necro decks of the time. Um, I didn't qualify, though, because uh, what it didn't beat was Academy. Uh, Academy was just too ridiculous. Um, so it was, it was kind of funny. It was uh, uh, Mono Black beat Mono Blue, Mono Blue beat Mono Green, Mono Green beat Mono Black. Um, but I was, I don't know how many people are playing Mono Green besides me. Anyway, having said all that, um, at least to success, any degree of success. So I'm very sad to see the Rancor here because I'm intimately familiar with the interaction with Smokestack. And if I were to play the Smokestack and start ticking it up, my opponent, at least on the first tick, would just eat their Rancor over and over and start drawing extra cards off to sit this. It'd be just a total nightmare uh, for me. So that plan's out the window. I'm glad I didn't take that route, as a matter of fact. All right, so for this turn, I'm going to go ahead and get my uh, card. Although, <laughs> if I can deal with the Sithis and the Rancor and stuff, um, it's going to be a lot easier to get the Smokestack into play, or at the very least, the Torque. And I draw Vandal Blast. Not looking super helpful here. All right, so I'm going to play the Workshop for the turn, and I'm going to, after some consideration, go ahead and play the Torque. And I've got a black floating, and I'm going to um, calling the weak my rog. And then with the mana from that, um, I'm going to tap the torque and cast Tevesh Shazat. We're going to make a couple of dorks, and with the mana from with the uh, creatures now out of the way, we're going to go ahead and use the Phyrexian Tower, grab double black, and thought sees my opponent. And the reason I'm kind of running through all this, I would like to thought sees the ranker out of their hand, like you know, but there's no, it, it's not great for me to kind of bank on that. My opponent's getting up to a critical and scary mass of both cards and mana. So I really want a Thoughtseize here to make sure I'm just not about to lose the game. And what I see is uh, Karametra's Blessing, which can make a creature hexproof and indestructible at instant speed. Shield of the Oversoul, which can make a creature indestructible, flying, and huge, and draws a card because it's an enchantment. And Timely Ward, which is an enchantment that they can play as Flash, which also makes a creature indestructible. So, other, so this is problematic, <laughs> but I think the most uh, scary card for me would be the Shield of the Oversoul, because this would give it also flying, and allow my opponent to pump his guy up, draw a card, because it's an uh, enchantment, make his guy indestructible, and put a lot of pressure on my commander, which I don't want. Right now, he can already put a lot of pressure because of the Rancor, but I don't want it growing as well. It would get plus two, plus two, so at five, it would, it would take huge chunks out of Tevesh Shazat. The way that it is now, if I want to chump block, they'll trample over for two, or if I don't chump block, they'll hit for three, but that's a lot slower than five. So we'll take the shield of the Oversoul. Oh, I got it. I'm not actually in the game. All right. And leave the, uh, we know the forest, the Bountiful Promenade, uh, or Promenade. I'm not sure. 
sure on pronunciation of that one. I'm going to call it promenade, uh, like lemonade. And uh, Timely Ward and Karametra's Blessing are the last few cards there. So, all right, I'm going to attack in. I'm actually, at this point, willing to trade a uh, Dark Confidant for a uh, Sithis off the board. I'm not going to be blocking because they have all these instant tricks that will make their guy live. So this is the only real chance I have to attack. I might as well chip in for a couple points of damage against my opponent's life total in case you draw like a Sylvan Library. And in the meantime, if they were to block here uh, and then draw a play land and play their commander and that's all they do for the turn, um, more th I'm more than happy for that to be the case because then um, I, it would set me up in terms of tempo. Opponent's not foolish enough to take that uh, offered exchange. Instead, they just allow themselves to take two damage. For their turn, they draw and cast Timely Ward on their commander. So their commander now has uh, Indestructible, and of course they drew a card off of that. And then they play the uh, Promenade um, for the turn, so they're tapped out. So they can't play Karametra's Blessing here, which is very nice to know. And then they swing in for three damage against my commander. I'm not going to... this draws me a couple cards, so I'm not going to trade him off just to avoid taking three damage on the commander. Uh, we'll do this instead. All right, so let's draw for Dark Confidants. Finds me a Talisman. Okay, that's good. I mean, I have the Workshop. Grand Dynamo, even better. Now I just have to figure out exactly how I'm going to spend my mana this turn. Before I do that, though, let's uh, let's go ahead and draw a couple more cards. I, f I test to see if how much Rog costs there. It costs four. So the question is, do I want to draw four cards here, or do I want to try to draw two? And come up with a solution to the board. Remember, uh, excuse me, the commander's indestructible right now. So even if I were thinking like I wanted to like make it an artifact and Vandal Blast him, that's not going to work. Um, but I can kind of get there in a roundabout fashion by doing that same play on the Timely Ward and then doing it on the commander. First things first, I want to see what my next options are, and this one's a doozy. Look at that. Without Dark Confidant, I wouldn't have reached deep enough into the deck to find the Deadly Relic, which exiles... And we'll take that thing off the board and buy me a lot of time. They will get their Ranker back. That's unfortunate. But um, uh, but we can do other things this turn. So for now, we'll go ahead and just use the um, mana off of the Workshop and the Tower to make Dan Dynamo. We'll go ahead and play a Chrome Mox and get rid of one of our Artifact Removals, the Vandal Blast. I'll go ahead and exile that thing. The Ranker goes back to their hand. And then for the turn, I'm going to play a Smokestack. And finally, I'm going to turn that Utopia Sprawl into an artifact and kill it with Ember's Shieldbreaker. So the reason I do this is now, on my opponent's turn, they can play a land and play their uh, Sithis, but they can't Rancor it and draw an extra card, and that gives me... Uh, I get to draw a card, look with Dark Confidence, second card, and then grab a couple more cards, three, frankly, off of Tevesh if I use Rog. And so I get five cards next turn to find removal for their commander before they can start turning it into an effective draw engine here. So that sounds good to me. So my opponent's turn, they play the forest that we know about. And they play their commander. Okay, so here we go. we got five cards to find a solution. We'll go ahead and tick up the smokestack here. Remember, trying to solve the problem, uh, either solve the problem of the commander or at least get the rancor out of their hand before they can start feeding it to the smokestack. Otherwise, this kind of backfires tremendously. Now, artifact removal will do it. I did have to imprint one here to make the play that I made last turn. Uh, so we're down in Artifact Removal, but maybe. All right, Smoke Sack's done. Um, I drew for the turn, Mox Diamond, and I found a Springleaf Drum off the Confidant. Not what we're looking for at all. So let's see if we can we can get there with the Commander. It gives me the most cards that I can possibly see is uh, three more. So let's take a look. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and play the Talisman here. That's pretty much right. I should have went ahead and sacked first. Oh, I see why I did it. Never mind. Uh, incorrect. That, that was fine. So I do the I do the Talisman into Springleaf Drum so that I can tap this before I sacrifice it. That's that's what the deal is. Okay, that, that actually makes sense. So I'll go ahead and tap it for black because, you know, there are triple black is a good pressure point here. Let's see. Uh, I need black more than I need red is the bottom line. And I don't find huh, a solution for the Rancor, but I do find a solution for the Commander. Sort of Fire and Ice. Not, exo not at all what I was expecting to uh, solve this problem, but... Hey, we can play a land, we'll play the Soul Ring. I'm going to hold this for a turn when I have two lands in my uh, hand, and, I'll, and then I'll play them both on the same turn. So this will this is ramp waiting to happen, and it'll surely happen with the amount of cards I'm drawing. All right, so three, four, five, six, seven. Let's go ahead and play Embrith, Sword, Equip, 
and swing. This is incorrect, by the way. I should not have tapped. That was super aggressive. Remember, Sword of Fire and Ice actually draws a card um, if it connects. And if my opponent did not block and I connect and I drew, like, Winter Orb here, I'd feel pretty stupid having played the Embrith. Now, that said, under zero, like, there's no world where my opponent should not be blocking. Because if he doesn't block, I'm going to deal two to his guy and kill it and draw a card. If he, And deal four to him. If he blocks, um, the creature dies, but the other two things, the four damage and the um, card draw, do not happen. So there's no world where my opponent shouldn't block here. So I guess that's why I did it, assuming my opponent's not a complete, you know, like, throwing the game. But uh, it was still wrong. Uh, let your opponent play well. Don't don't just assume they're going to play well. And uh, in this case, however, um, this is such an advantage, right? I'm going to kill. My opponent can chump block here, but then they have to sack to smoke stack, and they're down to three cards, some creature-related stuff in their hand that we know about, and who knows what else. And they're behind this wall of uh, card drawing and a card advantage. And with that in mind, my opponent just gives up and jumps into another game, which makes a lot of sense. All right, so ranks 0, 2, 1, 3. Joins me for a second round with, uh, this time, Azor the Lawbringer. I'm kind of sad to see they switched commanders because this commander is uh, six mana, and so I feel it's probably um, probably uh, useless, but um, we'll see. Anyway, this hand does not play a turn three commander. Very close, though. If this had one more land in it, so we could go like first turn Diabol Content, we could go get Lotus and play the commander on turn two. Uh, but we can't, and I can't guarantee I'll find that mana, so it's a mulligan. All right, this hand, um, early Necro possibly, but does not play turn three commander. This hand's not a keepable hand. This hand does play turn three commander. First turn, tutor with the seal for a Lotus, second turn commander. So we'll keep this one. Um, you can see I was playing around. This was the, uh, this is this is what black market connections uh I was playing around with Jitte in that slot just because um, because Jitte keeps it, it's on my mind it's a card that I think if this deck ends up with all these you know self damaging effects and games go long enough then Jitte becomes quite good it's a question of whether or not games go long enough so I had it in here but I, I kept I was like well whatever it doesn't matter what I put in there I've had Monkey in there I've had Jitte in there uh, Mox Monkey, but I, I, I think ultimately, if you're testing, probably just use Dark Tutelage because, as I said in the intro, um, it's the closest thing to BMC that, that's out there. Um, so, and uh, it would have been better as Black Market Connections here. I could have potentially changed the way that I played this out. You know, like I could have tutored for like uh, Soul Ring, for example, and then second turn go land Soul Ring, BMC, or um, Tutelage, and then start drawing extra cards or whatever. So, certainly an option, and then and then play turn three commander. But uh, at any rate, Jitte not a keepable card here. And then I have to get rid of one other card. Um, this can be black or red, but it cannot be black and red. I don't have any other sources, and so this card is a little slow based on my hand. So I'm going to keep the stack and the tome, and eventually I will draw red, but I don't have it right now. So I get rid of the rampage, and I keep like this. <clears throat> Depending on what I draw, oof, rag. So, you know, I'd really like to go first turn Ragavan, but I, I just, I mean, is that really the play? I decide mm, it is, but I don't like this. We'll put it that way. I don't like this at all. I'm going to go ahead and play Rog as well. Because now I'm off of black and I'm not Imperial Ceiling. But, on the other hand, this can get me a treasure and get me black mana. But, boy, I'm, I'm kind of risky. And look at that. My opponent has... Rapid hybridization. Okay, so now I have a three-three, but I can't play my command. I can't play my commander fast like I wanted to. Uh, this is problematic. Uh, no black. Okay, so I'm going to attack for three, uh, but first I'm going to play Tome of Legends. So lucky for me, it resolved. Hopefully they don't disenchant it. Um, but now I can attack with the Rog and put another counter on it. And so I do have a card drawing engine running, uh, despite the fact that my opponent has disrupted me pretty hard by killing that Rag, and by me. Um, going on that uh, game plan. They play Anticipate, which is just Impulse for three instead of for four. Uh, possibly a card that I should consider playing more often when I'm playing blue. Uh, even though you only dig for three instead of four, it's still very, very reasonable as an effect at two mana. Anyway, for their turn, Reliquary Tower, so their mana is a little weak right now. And then they foretold a card. So I have no idea what this is. I feel like the power level of this deck is not the same as the power level of the deck we just faced, though. <clears throat> All right, drawing deflecting swap gives me a little bit of comfort there. I'm going to go ahead and uh, 
draw a card because I, and I do it this way because I'm actually thinking of wastelanding them because every turn that I'm drawing two cards is a good turn for me and I don't have a lot else going on and all I need is a black to really get things cooking so luckily for me I do find that mana there so I'm gonna go ahead and play that attack put the counter on the tome <clears throat> post combat um, and then I realized, wait a minute, I don't have to wasteland them here and then cast Seal to go get mana. I, I have, because of that last draw, I actually have a Counterspell and a um, Calling the Weak. I just need to not sack Rog, or I won't be able to Deflecting Swat. So we'll go ahead and Calling the Weak to 3-3, three, three, and then just go for the Commander. It sticks, lovely, I get another counter on Tomes, so there's three cards in the bank, and I can just draw three here right away. So we'll do that. And then if I could play another land this turn, I'd play the shot and get the talisman down and play the Imperial Seal, but I'm going to have to wait a turn for that. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so the opponent... Jeez, uh, I'm going to throw this thing in the wash afterwards. Uh, plays a card I've never even seen before. <laughs> Angelic Ascension. Exile target creature, a Planeswalker, its controller... Now, this card's interesting. Remember I said the modal card, you couldn't deflect to something that has... Not not the mode that's selected. Like if it says just if it says choose one, destroy target artifact, destroy target creature, destroy target planeswalker, and you deflect it, you have to deflect it to a target that matches what their choice was. This card is not mobile, modal. This is multi mode. This card targets a creature or planeswalker. So if I had a creature in play, like my rog, rog that I sacked, or if I had made creatures with Devesh, I could actually deflecting swap this to one of my creatures, and I'd get a four four angel and keep my commander. Um, of course, if my opponent had a creature, I could do the same to their creature. But my opponent um, has no creatures, nor do I, so I can do either one. So I'm just going to end up with a 4-4 four, four and no commander. But that commander's already drawn three cards, so... Um, and give me a 4-4. Four, four. I'm not really sure my, why my opponent's like, here, have a 3-3, three, three, have a 4-4, four, four, and I'll beat my face in with them. But um, <clears throat> I'm down for it. I'm here for it, rather. All right, I'm going to go ahead and play Workshop. Uh, and then I'm just going to go for a smokestack. <clears throat> because if this sticks, um, that gives me an easy path to victory. It makes the game semi-hopeless for my opponent. And of course I have SWAT to back it up. I'll go ahead and uh, Imperial Seal here. And then Tome the card that I want directly into my hand, which is going to be Strip Mine. Um, if you noticed, my opponent played a very weak land and then no land. So I'm thinking that my opponent's in a lot of trouble. And I'm intending to wasteland them very soon. Especially since I'm hitting them with a 4-4 four, four flyer and putting counters on a smokestack. And I still have a card dra drawing engine running. So yeah, I'm feeling really good about this. The strip mine's just um, going to break their back, right? Uh, okay, so this actually had a uh, counter on it. Um, not zero counters. Um, so uh, I, I don't know if this is like a mistake or whatever. Opponent plays clear the mind. I've never seen this before. Target player shuffles their graveyard in their library. Draw a card. That'd be so much better if it was an instant, but uh, it's an interesting card. Uh, it's a bad one, but it's interesting. F far as bad cards go, if they're three, ma if a bad card is three mana or under and says draw a card, then uh, although it's bad um, because it doesn't affect the board state or anything like that, it's a sideboard card basically. Uh, at least it cycles for some, you know, a little bit of mana there. Uh, but if doing it at sorcery speed in a blue deck is is just terrible, so. If the card was an instant, it'd be all right. Um, anyway, uh, we'll definitely... Oh, I, I, I could have swore I... Yeah, that's so weird. I don't know how... I must have missed my trigger on the stack. I don't know how that happened, but uh, obviously I didn't miss it here. Uh, yeah, still still running the Jete here, but totally useless. I'm going to play the Talisman, um, play the uh, Rog, which gets me another counter on my Tome. Go ahead and draw a card for the turn. And then, boom, boom, we're going to kill blue, blue, atta uh, attack for four. And then at this point, my opponent concedes. Of course, during their upkeep, they have to sack, like, probably the Reliquary Tower. And then they're just sitting on a single planes against this completely hopeless game. So we move on to the next game for them. And uh, this time, ranks 0, 2, 1, 3. And they play in their same deck. Is this that game? No. This is a new new one, or is this the same game? This is that same game, right? Let me double check. Yeah, it's that same game. Okay, so we're on the game four against ranks zero, two, one, three. 
And I don't know which deck they're playing here, but we'll see. Uh, still playing their Azora the Lightbringer deck. I really think their other deck is probably better, but uh, I've got a uh, pretty good start. This is a turn three commander or sooner, so we will keep. Uh, those are the rules. Uh, and you will see later on how um, adamant I am about adhering to this rule. And uh, holy smokes, look at this drop. This is crazy. This is so fun. All right, let's play uh, zero drop, uh, zero mana enchantment. A uh, zero mana uh, mox, a, another uh, artifact for zero, and yet another artifact for zero. I like where this is going. And then for the turn, I'm going to drop Winter Orb into play. That now makes the uh, mox opal active, and uh, I can either Vampiric, Imperial, or equip the Paradise Mantle and pass. So any of those are all very reasonable plays. Imperial Seal is probably. In some ways, probably the most reasonable, but I think what I decide to do is uh, equip the Paradise Mantle, which is okay. All right, opponent plays Port Town. Um, that is not Port Town. Um, but we are going to go to Port Town here real soon. So the first thing I'm going to do is Vampiric during upkeep, and uh, my opponent wisely chooses not to counter if they do have a counter. Unfortunately for them, the card I'm getting cannot be countered. All right, we're going to Port Town, Rishadan Port Town. I've got Rishadan Port and a Winter Orb running and uh, alternate sources of mana. This is just a nightmare for a de uh, anybody, but particularly a deck like that. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and cast Imperial Seal and see what happens. It lands, so we'll go ahead and tutor up the uh, card that we want here. I can make a, uh, if it didn't, so if my opponent like countered it or whatever, I could choose to make a Robot or do Rishadan Port. Um, but with that landing, um, I still have the same option, but it kind of like, solidifies for me which choice I'm going to make. So during my opponent's upkeep, I'm going to go ahead and tap their... Uh, I'm going to port their port down for a uh, ironic twist here. And my opponent plays their land and passes. And I'm going to be untapping the um, Rishadan port every time. And the card I tutored for? Strip mine. Beautiful. All right, so we're going to go ahead and float with Saga. No robots, this, no robots for this game. Get a soul ring here. Port their untapped island. They float some mana. Now, um... I make a misplay here. The correct play is cast, or sorry, play strip mine and then enter my attack phase and strip their island during combat and then exit combat and uh, they have no untapped lands. Um, I make a mistake. I just clear their mana reflexively without, um, without um, strip mining first, uh, which means that I can strip mine now, but my opponent has blue mana untapped. This is unfortunate. Lucky for me, I don't get punished, but that was a mistake, so that's mistake number two for the day. And I'll go ahead and strip mine their untapped blue, and at this point my opponent concedes. Of course, I'm about to draw three or make some guys. I think right here, uh, honestly, it, it's a toss-up, because if you make, if I, if I sack, then um, the Paradise Mantle's offline, but the rest of my stuff's online, so I think the correct plan really was, really would have been to eat this guy and draw three. There's always a chance that I could draw land too and throw the Mox Diamond into the mix if I need it. So, anyway, um, yeah, so that's a pretty savage start. You can see how incredibly valuable Rishadam Port is uh, in a deck that's running Winter Orb. Whenever possible, you want to add. Basically, if you're running a Winter Orb deck, you want to run Port. I think in hindsight, um, that's something that I never used in like Brea, but it was probably worth a slot for me. I probably should have. And if I go back to build that deck, there's a good chance that I will be playing Port, as well as Dust Bowl, even if I have to put them in spell slots, because I have found, after playing this deck, that the two cards are extremely good, um, and uh, it's interesting how Port, Rishadam Port, and Dust Bowl actually completely dominated Magic for a very long time, and they've kind of dropped off, but I'm coming back around to uh, both cards now that I'm running them again, and... Uh, finding that I really enjoy having them in my decks. And they're like spells that you can put in land slots because they produce mana. I mean, sorry, they're like lands that you can put in spell slots. In the same way, I'm going to, so my opponent conceded there. We'll move on to the next game in just a second. But an analogy to that card would be something like uh, this. This is a spell that goes in a land slot, essentially. Like this is, it says 29 lands, but we're actually running 30 lands because this is actually a land, right? Rishadam Port is actually a, the opposite. It's a land that also can be put in a spell slot. Tap target land. Uh, along the lines of a 
uh, the equivalent of this would be um, um, this card here. So this card, Icy Manipulator, uh, for one mana you tap target artifact creature or land. So you have to play the Icy for four and then for one you can you can tap. Icy is insane with Winter Orb because you can tap the Winter Orb or tap their land depending on what looks better. Plus you can attack tap attackers to to you know have that huge flexibility. This card's crazy, crazy good. I know we totally run in this deck, but at four, it's like, it's like, ah, the card is just a little, if this card was three, boom, in the deck in a second. I, I would love for them to print like a snowy manipulator and have it be the same card, except like snow artifact and just cost three and have like snow mana to activate. That'd be sexy. Um, and then I would play it because the card's great and it helps very much with a deck like this that doesn't have, um, that uh, that needs to use like artifacts and stuff to work around the limitations within your colors, um, but at four it's just a little too little too a smidge too little value for the for the benefits that you get. But we get to play a card that functions as tap target land by putting a mana into it right here um, in the icy manipulator slot. But it is a land and produces mana for us and and can actually go in this slot over here. And I love that. So super great. Anyway, um, also the art on the old IC is just, it's just, ah, oh, it's so beautiful. I'm, I'm such a um, fan of the old school uh, art, man. It's just, the new stuff made with computers, to me, is just so much less interesting than the old stuff that was hand-painted. Um, I just, even though it has like an old school simplistic feel to it, it has like an authenticity to it that the new stuff, like a, a soul to it that the new stuff kind of lacks in my view. All right, so Acker, a totally different opponent playing Synthus again. I don't know why this commander suddenly becomes super popular, but I can't say I've never lost to it. I have lost to it. I mean, if it starts rolling with its engine, it can just shut you out. And you'll see this is a rough, this this game here is actually rough. So do I have a turn three or sooner commander with this hand? Um, the answer is actually yes. The answer may surprise you how quickly I can get my commander out. So I'm going to keep Opponent, I'm going first. My opponent has Gemstone Caverns here and Exiles Terramorphic Expanse. I'm disappointed to see that because turn two Sithis is a lot scarier than, uh, turn one rather, is a lot scarier than turn two. Uh, but I'm going to continue with my play and hope, hopefully we'll, uh, I won't get punished too hard here. So I'm going to go for Badlands and then I'm Dark Ritualing and I'm going to play my command, I'm going to uh, spend two on Grim Monolith to float, cast Rog, Diabolic Intent, away the rog. You see it now? And played the Jeweled Lotus. If you didn't see it, um, I actually had turn one commander with that hand. But it's an all-in play, right? And I'm so sad to see this because typically the answers to this commander are going to be three mana from those colors. because it'll, Or, or two, two or three mana, rather. It might be, for example, the enchantment that uh, turns it into a, an elk for two mana. So I'm really nervous about that. I don't. I'm I'm so in on this play, and I have. I need to use these guys to find more mana so I can get back into the game because I've really kind of gone all in on this. Um, but on the other hand, going all in on turn one is, is is the time. And if they don't have that, then the next best answer would be something like uh, maybe Oblivion Ring, and then that is a card that they might play off of uh, like a, a mana crypt or a land soul ring. So I actually, I'm really nervous about these Chemstone Caverns because. Uh, I just don't know what they're going to do here. So first thing they do is fetch. So we dodged like the Ancient Tomb Oblivion Ring play. Don't do it, don't do it. All right, it's Sithis. But, and that's bad, but not... It does not kill Tevesh Shazat. And so we are we are happy. And I find, see what I mean about the spell and land, of course. Um, I'm going to go ahead and draw some cards here. Of course, I find more mana. In fact, all that I could ever want. Uh, for the most part, more lands, that is. And we'll go ahead and fetch here. And I had a choice to, to get the dual land or the basic mountain. Why did I get the basic mountain? Because what I said at the beginning of the game, if you can afford to leave, I don't need the dual land here. And I have nothing that's double black currently. And I want to leave it there as a target so that if I draw um, Verdant or if I draw another red X fetch or whatever, I can go get it if I need it. So um, I'm going to go ahead and just Angris Rampage here and kill uh, Sithis Harvest Hand. And my opponent's like a creature, basically, and pass for the turn. Opponent plays a tapped Temple Garden and nothing. Great. Well, if we're not doing anything, then I definitely want to be drawing more cards. So I'm actually going to make a creature here first. Sorry, I make creatures here first. 
And the reason is that, um, I, I, so I want to draw more cards and I want to disrupt my opponent, but what I can do if I play a little differently is I can actually make creatures here and then cast um, Sword of Fire and Ice. And now if my opponent plays land and plays a Sithis, it's dead on board. It's dead on arrival, right? It comes down and I equip, swing, and kill it. Um, but it's not just dead on arrival, but it's dead in perpetuity. So by doing this, I did take a turn off of card drawing, but... Um, I have a card, I put a second card drawing engine into play that also disrupts my opponent. So I felt this was okay, and I already have, I know I have a land coming up, uh, guaranteed I can, I can play another land next turn. So I, I didn't have to dig, like, for, to make sure that my next few plays are smooth, right? And my opponent's turn, they play Explore, get another land into play, and another land into play, that's oof. And then play Elephant Grass, so Elephant Grass, black creatures cannot attack at all, so none of my thralls can attack. Non-black creatures cannot attack unless they pay two for each. Propaganda. But it has cumulative upkeep one. Well, I can't really punish that. They've got enough lands in play. So this is going to buy my opponent some time, and I can't use that sword. So let's go ahead and draw instead. See what we can see. Oh, Jete again. Man, I want black market connections in this deck. So anyway, I did, however, draw Feed the Swarm. So I could, I could Feed the Swarm, Elephant Grass, and equip and swing. And maybe that is the play. But I decide instead I'm going to strip their uh, Temple Garden. Because they're going to have to pay a cumulative upkeep on that. That's going to go away here eventually. And then I'm just going to go ahead and um, play my Rog. Because I'd love to Ancestral next turn. And I'm going to pass. Alternately, of course, I can steal their Commander. And then this Rog play is not the best. But uh, here I, I'm curious to see what they do. Do they pay or not? So they do pay. All right. And they hit a land drop, and for the turn they can play their commander, except here's the problem. The reason I played Rog here is uh, I have another land in my hand. Sorry, I was saying draw three. But actually what I wanted to do was play the other land, equip the Rog, and a swing. And my opponent realizes that I can do just that. So he can tap the four mana and play his Sithis, but if he does, uh, it's just dead on arrival, right? Like, I'm uh, dead on board, rather. Um, not DOA, it won't die as soon as it, as soon as it comes into play, but it's dead on board because I, I have a, a method to kill it, assuming I draw a land, but it's a pretty safe bet that when I draw a card and then I could draw even more cards off these guys that that's going to happen. And of course, if my opponent doesn't do anything, I can also ultimate to Vesh. But uh, with that in mind, we move on to the next game, and that game is against X under 4 life X. And X under 4 life X is playing... Partners, Timna and Tana, which is interesting. Not something you see. Reminds me of Tannis Half Elven, since it's a Tana and it's an elf, but uh, similar in name. Anyway, I've got. Uh, <clears throat> man, Priest of the Forgotten Gods is so good against uh, partners. Ah, uh, man, fast mana, removal. This is so good, but if I can go land, land, priest, and assuming I get my commander down and they all live. I still am one creature short from tapping the Breast in order to get the mana to ramp up my commanders. This really isn't a turn three commander, even if we, as much as we want it to be. So I decide that uh, I'm not going to break the rule, I'm just going to mulligan. This is definitely not a turn three commander. Is it? <clears throat> or is it? Well, actually, <clears throat> I could go first turn tower, eat my guy, play talisman, use the talisman to Thoughtseize or Shattering Spree on turn one, depending on what my opponent does. Um, and then on turn two, I can play a land, tap for two, play the commander again, and then on turn three, I can play the commander. So this is actually a turn three commander, so I'll keep. I decide to get rid of the Graven Cairns, and let's see what happens. First turn, City of Brass, Mana Crypt, pass. Thankfully, whew, going first, they didn't have, like, I don't know, Wheel of Fortune or something gross. Oh, a Spring Leaf Drum is nice. Now, this is a very risky play that I make. I think that this risk is probably not justifiable here. Um, it does come with some significant upside, but I play Spring Leaf Drum and then the Commander, and then I tap that. If my opponent had Artifact Removal right there, that, that could have gone pretty poorly. The other reason it could go poorly is they actually have, they're playing red and they have the mana for Deflecting Swat. Oh, I hope I don't get swatted here. I might have just opened the door for all the game loss, right? Shattering Spree. Oh no. Oh, it's White Man he's tapping for. Phew, what is he doing though? Is he making it indestructible? Like, is he flashing out the 2 1 flyer? What's going on? Flashing out Village Bell Ringer. So, this is a card that has 
the ability to combo with um, with uh, 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 what's the enchantment? Um, splintering twin, splintering twin, or with uh, Kiki Jiki to go infinite and uh, produce infinite creatures. So that's not good. But at least we got the crypt off the board. I will pass for the turn. So now for my opponent's turn, they get to play a land. Cast Elves of Deep Shadow. Sad to see that happening. Not sure why they didn't cast it off the pool there. I think they missed. Uh, they, they cost themselves life for no reason. And yeah. We're going to draw. Okay, so this is a little frustrating because now my opponent's close to Timna. Timna is such a ridiculous card. Um, partners in general just ridiculous, ridiculous mechanic. All right. Um, but I'm going to play the Phyrexian, Phyrexian Tower. Now the question is, do I want to use it? Because if I do, I certainly want to tap this with the drum first. But then I'll be turning off the drum mana later. Uh, so let's see what I decide to do. I'm thinking about it. But I'll get the black at Thoughtseize. And maybe with some more information, I'll have a better idea. Because what I could do here is sack, play Talisman, and then cast like Feed the Swarm, for example. Or I can just play the Talisman and hold the Feed. In response, my opponent vamps. Ah, so that's not good. I don't have perfect information. I don't know what they tutored for. I see Archon of Valor's Reach and a Scrubland. I'm going to take the Archon. So if they have Splinter Twin, I'm pretty sure... Yeah, you play it, play it on this and then just win the game. Makes me pretty nervous. Um, and they've got the mana to do it. So I screw up here. Uh, what I should have done is killed one of these two creatures and passed. But I play the Talisman here. This was a huge error. That's error number three. I just allowed my opponent to kill me with a Splinter Twin. Um, not really good play here. Luckily, for whatever reason, uh, I have no idea what they what they went and got even. Um, they just play Timna and get themselves an extra card. It's unfortunate, but it doesn't win the game, so okay. I'm going to draw for the turn. There's Priest. That's very, very good against a deck like this. Um, but we're just kind of like, I have to figure out. Like, I have all these... I want to, all these things I want to do. I want to get my commander down. I want to do these things. It's like, uh, everything's challenging here. I think, at this point, I'm going to go ahead and kill Timna and play the Priest. And the interesting thing about Priest is it'll block this and kill it, block this and live. So if my opponent goes, if, if their play for the turn is land, recast Timna and attack, I can just block and deny them the card. So I take this route only because... Um, I mean, if they're going to combo kill me, they're going to combo kill me at this point. Um, I'd rather... It didn't seem like they are, though, because they didn't do it last turn. So I'm going to go ahead and take the, like I said, take the Timna off the board and risk it. And, uh, excuse me, for their turn, they play Lin Vala, Keeper of Silence, which is so funny because I have, like, nothing in this deck that would be affected by that, except for Priest. I think it's the only card. Ah, dang it. Okay. I mean, at least I'm not dead. On my turn, I draw a Dust Bowl. Not unhappy to see it. At all. Look at all those juicy targets. But uh, we will need to figure out how to get there. Alright, so I'm going to go ahead and... start. Speaking of getting there, though, I'm going to go ahead and play the uh, commander. And make some blockers. And p p pass for the turn. Oh, no, no. I'm sorry. I'm going to play the commander and sack. And pass for the turn. So the reason I'm doing this is that... Linvala can hit this... But I can block this and kill it. Or block this. And my opponent... So basically they can get through for four. They can't kill the commander here. So I want to get cards right away, and then, um, as it turns out, I can make yet another play this turn. Two more plays. Alright, and I'll pass for the turn. Um, at some point, I'm going to need to pull the trigger on Fiery Confluence here, and probably deal with... I need to get Billage Bell Bellringer off the board. I want to cut into their mana. I need to attack their mana with Dust Bowl. There's a lot of things I need, so drawing cards there kind of gets me choices. I've got this Priest just sitting here, like, frustratingly close to being useful. All right, so my opponent's turn. They play Dark Confidant and Fire Covenant. So I literally have no idea what it was that they tutored for. Did they tutor for Dark Confidant, Fire Covenant, Lin Vala? Which of these three cards did they go get? Did they get a land? Like, I'm completely clueless on this. But um, luckily, they have to use mana to make this play, so they actually can only attack for four and not five on the um, Tevesh, which is really good. And I, you know, they, they killed my Priest, but... Hey, I've got, um, geez. but I've got Fiery Confluence, and I am planning to, I do kind of need to sweep the board before they draw extra cards, take them off some mana and such, but boy, it'd be really nice if I could also get rid of uh, Lin Vala, 
because Lynn Vala is a bit of a pain. So is uh, Bell Ringer, but Lynn Vala is like going to crush Tavesh very quickly. Is there a way I could do that, though? Is there a way that I can kill Confidant and Lynn Vala this turn? And after thinking about it for uh, a, an extended amount of time, I realized that, yeah, in fact, there is just barely, but I can do it. So what we're going to do is we're going to play that Scalding turn, I believe. Oh, we're going to make some guys. Tap. Eat. Uh, float. And uh, I don't think I actually had Scalding Tarn here, by the way. Uh, I think this is a bug. I don't remember what I did have, but it wasn't Scalding Tarn, because this turn would have been a hell of a lot easier had I had Scalding Tarn. Um, but if you notice, uh, I now have uh, six cards in Graveyard. And that's going to matter in a second, because I'm tutoring up a... Barbarian Ring. And if I play my seventh card, Fiery Confluence, I floated just enough mana to have exactly one red left over. I'm going to do two to everything and two to my opponent. And then, since this thing took two damage already, and I have one mana, and Fiery Confluence makes my seventh card, I get Threshold, and bang. Kill and Vala. So did you see it? Maybe I did have... Oh, no, I did have Scalding Tarn. I'm sorry. This isn't bugged. It's just that you can't play both Scalding, Scalding Tarn and Barbarian Ring in the same turn. That's That was <laughs> that was the reason I, I had to go the hard way and do the map confluence thing. So very cool. And Tevesh is at three against a one-power creature. So my opponent could top deck a land, play Timna, and draw another card. Um, but it's a lot better than... Um, that's a lot better than where we were. So they, they attack... They just draw a land or elf and attack Tevesh down for a point. And now... I bought myself a lot of time, and we can start um, bowling for, uh, well, not Columbine here, but we're going to bowl for uh, for mana destruction instead. So the way we're going to do this is right off the bat, I want to get Rog down, and then using Rog, because I intend to keep him around for a little while, uh, I make some blockers to protect Tavesh here, and then I'm going to sack that Scalding Tarn. Rather than fetching with it, I'm going to kill a City of Brass. So now... I took I just took out two red sources because of reflecting pool. And pass for the turn. And I've got blockers for Tevesh if I need them. Opponent swings in. Um, I don't need them. It's just gonna take a couple counters off him, but um, so I'll just leave the thralls in play for my Frexian Tower food and uh Tevesh Shazat food. I draw a smoke stack for the turn. Alright, so I would like to play the stack, but I'd also like to uh, continue to hammer my opponent's land. So let's do that first. I'm going to go ahead and tap and eat and just draw three and see if I get like any fast mana or something else to do with it. Instead, I find uh, Inquisition. Um, do I have enough mana to do everything? Well, let's see. I Inquisition, and this is not target opponent. It's target player, so he could bounce that back and make me lose my uh, Yogwell. I'd have to choose it for myself. Uh, but fortunately, I killed their red last turn, so he actually can't. Uh, alternately, my opponent could have deflecting swatted the Dust Bowl effect back to the Dust Bowl, which would have been brutal. Thank goodness I killed the city last turn. So we'll take that deflecting swat out of hand. I, I really feel like swat's getting out of hand uh, this turn. Anyway, and I'm going to play Thran Dynamo and then use the uh, Dust Bowl. I am not smoke stacking this turn, but I now cut him off from white. I can't cut him off from green, so I chose white because, you know, uh, the Llanowar Elves is in place still. Once I get rid of that, then I would have preferred to cut him off from green, but white will have to do. All right, so my opponent's turn, they get to swing in, and um, once again, um, Tavesh can just take it. I don't worry about that later. I, I can use, I can eat one of these to draw cards, and I can eat the other one for mana, so I want to leave them both in play. Draw for the turn. I draw on a braid. It's beautiful. All right, so let's tap one of those for mana. Eat the one that I just tapped. See if there's a better play. Ooh, Paints here is very acceptable. Sad that I used the drum prior to drawing now because I could have used the drum to tap the Paints here on the turn it comes into play, which means I'd start getting cards a turn early on, on a Dark Confidant schedule rather than a Paints here schedule, which is, this is one of the combos with uh, Paints here, by the way. So, oh well. All right, so I'm going to um, sack my Polluted Delta because I actually need all of the mana this turn. Otherwise, I wouldn't have fetched with it. Uh, but I need all the mana so that I can um, make this play here. We're going to go ahead and Dust Bowl my opponent using the land I just fetched. All right, now they've got no mana in play. Cast the Smokestack, and then cast the Pain Seer. Oh, no, pardon me, not cast the Pain Seer, and then cast the Abrate. Pain Seer will have to wait, uh, but next turn I can play him and then tap him. But by doing this, I now have cut my opponent off from green as well. 
So they have no mana of any color that they can produce. And they can attack Tevesh down to one once again. No problem. I'll just eat my thrall and draw some cards. Alright, we'll take up Smokestack in a moment. Alright, so that... I understand what happened in the last game. The first trigger of Smokestack is, uh, is for zero. That's why I was thinking I, I didn't tick it up. What? Uh, the first trigger for, is for zero. It's not the add counters trigger, it's the sacrifice. So you, the first thing that happens is you say, hey, sacrifice zero permanence. So that's where I got confused in the last game. Anyway, looks good here. Obviously, I had the monster will to follow up if my opponent were to have continued that game. But uh, rightfully, they scoop. And of course, we will be killing Dust Bowl next turn, playing the Pains here. And then after that, we'll will and do it all again if the game had gone on. So, all right, next is uh, Furs, Fairs, Fairs, Bueller, you're my hero. All right, I'm playing Fairs. Um, with the little uh, uh, kitten as their as their icon, it's kind of neat. And this opponent is playing uh, Sliver Overlord, but they could be playing a Sliver deck. They could also be playing a uh, deck that uses just a couple of like Premier Slivers, maybe, or maybe they're not playing any Slivers at all, and this is just their commander to fool you, and they're playing a five color commander. There's no way to know, and I'm definitely going to take their deck seriously regardless. But I have a hell of a start. I get to go Curse early on. I get to play Priest. Um, and uh, I've got a him, a sword, plenty of mana. If I go first turn curse, second turn um, land, I attack, that's three mana. Turn three land, I attack, that's five mana. So this is a turn three commander, so this is a key. And I'm going first this game, which is nice. So my opponent is now cursed. And they play a tap land for the turn. I've got a chrome mox. It doesn't actually get me there any faster. Um, so the, really the only question is, do I want to play Priest or Hymn them? I decide that I will wait on the Hymn, and I'll go ahead and Priest them right now. Or rather, get the Priest down right now. Because um, if I curve correctly, next turn I go land, play the Commander, uh, spit out a couple guys, tap the Priest, kill whatever it is that they played, and then Hymn them. That's a beautiful curve, so we'll just call it good here. An opponent, huh, who seemed to be like playing uh, maybe not quite so scary deck all of a sudden uh, makes it very scary with a uh, mana crypt into Farseek. Oh, goodness. Into a Triome, into a uh, Changeling. Okay. I was getting real nervous about what was going on over here until I saw the Changeling. Then I was less nervous. Uh, anyway, we're going to go ahead and make the uh, play I described earlier. So land. Going to attack, get the, get the curse. Uh, triggering. Thank you, Curse of Opulence, for making a turn three to Eshazat. Go and make some guys. Eat those guys. Uh, kill my opponent's Changeling. I grab double black off of that. Him, two of the four cards out of my opponent's hand. And pass for the turn. Very nice turn. And with that, my opponent draws and scoops. Um, <clears throat> if they're playing a creature based deck, I mean, an active priest uh, to Vesh combo pretty much ensures that they really are out of the game, um, even before you add in the Sword of Fire and Ice. So, very nice uh, Priest and Curse doing exactly what they're supposed to do and demonstrating why we're actually running these cards, as opposed to the games where they just come up and we do other stuff, you know? And it's all about having a massive amount of, of uh, integrated uh, synergies that we can pull off to get us where we want to go. We might have to take different roads, but all roads lead to Rome kind of a deal. So all roads, roads in this deck lead to um, mana advantage and destruction of the opponent's resources. All right, so in this final game here, we're playing against Poppy Parker, um, playing Rankle, Master of Pranks. Um, and this does not play the commander on turn three. If I go first turn Saga, second turn it ticks up, I go land this. Turn three, well, it, it does. I, I take that back. It does play the commander on turn three. This is a keepable hand, but I think what ended up happening is I didn't see it until later. I'm also, yeah, I'm going first, so I could have gone Saga, tick it up, land, Talisman Duress, uh, and then tick it up, tap it, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, this is a turn three commander, so this was actually a keep. I don't see it, so I make the mistake of mulliganing. Um, such as such as life and this is not a turn three commander not quite if I had one more land here Then I could I could probably say it's a turn three commander because I could go uh, Land Inquisition and then followed up by land mocks 
Crucible, and then follow that up by a land. I guess, no, it wouldn't be a turn three commander. So this wouldn't actually be a keep, even with one more land. Unless that land was Ancient Tomb or something. But it's going to have to be a mulligan. No commander on turn three in this hand. Mulligan. I don't see a turn three commander here anywhere. Uh, so we're going to mulligan. There is a turn three commander. And all I have to do is keep three cards. And it has to be the right three. So we're going to have to get rid of, unfortunately, with great regret, uh, my opponent concedes to my mulligan to three before playing me. I was super disappointed that they conceded because this would have been a lovely game to, to extract a win from. But um, I think if you look at it, what do we want to put back? We're not putting back Crypt or Soul Ring, so that really leaves us with just one of the other cards. And uh, the only two cards that guarantee a turn three commander or better is the Torque and the Opal, but the Torque doesn't actually produce black, so that leaves the Opal. So the only three cards that we can actually keep in order to follow the rules and play our turn three commander is Opal, Crypt, Soul Ring. So that's what we would have kept, and we would have mulliganed all the other four, and then gone first turn, play the entire hand, cast the red commander, second turn, play the black commander, draw three cards, get back in the game. Pretty awesome that you can mulligan to three. I did want to, I, I did, I, I included this game though because I want to make the point. Um, first of all, I missed what I should have done in the first hand, which was a keep. Ultimately, I actually like this hand better, frankly, but um, having said that, um, I'm really serious. <coughs> when it comes to this deck, you have got to mulligan to a turn three or better commander or you're not playing the deck correctly, you will get losses. Um, and most of the losses of mine from the last seven days, almost all of them were me breaking that rule and choosing to try to do something different because um, I thought, well, this hand's good enough. It has, you know, X, Y, or Z. Well, if it's not fast, it's not good enough. I mean, that's the bottom line. This deck is built to do what it needs to do. You need the engine running. And that's how, that's, that's just how you make this deck worse, work. And everything else in the, in the deck is designed to get the engine running and to kind of lubricate the uh, lubricate the machine, right? To, to keep the parts moving so you're not grinding your own gears. But most importantly of all, we are we are focused on getting that commander down and getting our card drawing go and then going and then disrupting our opponent before they can beat us because we don't have counter spells. We have to attack their resources and prevent them from killing us, um, or we're just going to lose games. And in a forty life format. There's no way to build this deck in such a fashion that we're going to um, deal 40 damage to our opponent faster than they can combo us out. So uh, we have to focus on slowing them down and grinding them down and putting them on uh, into a situation where they can't play. And then we can win our convenience. All right, so that is it. That is the deck. Uh, once again, Dark Tutelage. Uh, God, I love beautiful IC Manipulator. Uh, Dark Tutelage should be uh, Black Market Connections. Uh, if you are playing in paper, and as soon as the card is released online, we will make that swap. So this Dark Tutelage will come out. It'll be that simple. And this is what the uh, the deck would look like uh, once it's complete. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm really liking I'm really liking these uh, these two drop Priest, Pain Seer, Dark Confidant, Tome of Legends. Four different two drops that all draw cards. Feeling really good in the deck. And the land situation, it is a little bit, uh, it is a little bit, uh, um, it is a little bit uh, risky, but I believe that the risk is acceptable because in the games uh, of the format, hitting land drops is not the most important thing um, beyond like basically your opening hand, and sometimes not even then. As you saw, that last hand is the exact. Um, evidence that you need to understand why, uh, in my view anyway, why um, you just want enough lands and you don't need too many at all. Because in that last hand, I could mulligan to three, keep a zero land hand, and probably win the game on turn two. Effectively win the game on turn two. And that just shows you that lands just aren't the resource, the most important resource in this deck. If, a, if we're putting lands in this deck, we're putting them in the deck because the value they provide has to be, you know, very, very, very compelling. Like it has to be a land that disrupts your opponent mana, destroys your opponent's mana, two for ones you on acceleration, or uh, you know kills creatures with flexible options, you know uh, tutors for cards, um, and then occasionally a few lands that are designed to be like 
be like basically the equivalent of a mock sopo that you can only play. Like, um, if you look at it from the perspective of how a uh, mox amber or an opal or whatever actually works, um, those cards are basically lands because they're one card. It costs zero mana to play and produces exactly one mana, which is exactly what a land is. It's one card that costs zero to play and produces one mana. So if you have no cards in hand and you top deck a land or you top deck a mox, there's no difference between the two, um, assuming that the mox is, is on and you know there's no Karn out there's a, there's a you know there's no I don't know Blood Moon out right like obviously they're different but what I'm saying in terms of like mathematically in terms of what they give you uh, the only difference is that you can only play one land per turn you can play multiple Moxes per turn so um, other than or the, the the primary difference rather and so um, and so with that in mind uh, you want to play just enough lands ideally you hit exactly one per turn and no more than one per turn so that it functions like a mox that you can play a, uh, that you can play as your zero drop that produces mana um, but you don't want it to f you don't want multiple lands in your hands because now you've got a bunch of moxes you can't cast and for multiple turns like if you have three lands in your hand you can't play that third one till turn three that land that, that card just won't even play and so it's like a bad mox um, in that in that regard right so the point is the point I'm getting at is that we want just enough land so we can hit one per turn because we can only play one per turn but not so many that we uh, we, we we cannot uh, reliably sorry sorry not so many rather that they clutter up our hand and we have a handful of a bunch of lands that we we can't play for many 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 turns you have a hand with five lands in play you're not even using those resources for five turns. It's like, oh, this is agonizing, right? It's so useless to me in, under those conditions. And that's why Artifact Mana is so much better. And that's why the deck is such a low land uh, to artifact ratio or such a high artifact to land ratio, if you want to look at it that way, um, for that exact reason. Um, um, but also why I'm willing to take the risk and get mana screwed more often than I get mana flooded because... If I'm in a screwed, um, first of all, with the mulligan situation, it heavily favors not worrying about that and just going after um, strong opening hands. And secondly, if you're mana screwed, you can dig your way out of it very easily. And when you're digging your way out of it, you literally only need one land for that turn and then one land on the next turn. So if you're drawing like three and four cards to find your way out of a mana screw, um, you can find your way out of it very fast. But if you're mana flooded, there's nothing you can draw that's going to get that land, you know, you have five, six, seven lands in hand. Nothing is going to get that, you know, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh land in play any turn earlier. I mean, the only use you can do with the mana flood is your singular Mox Diamond. And other than that, those cards are just sitting in your hand doing nothing and can never come out. Like, you can never just, like, dump them into play, right? There's no fast bond in, in, this, in these colors. There's no... There's nothing. So... That's why um, Mana Screw is better than Mana Flood because if you're Mana Screwed, you might find the mana and then all of a sudden it, it turns your hand on and you just go bleh and you just burst it all into play and you're in the game. Um, mana Flood doesn't work that way. So uh, anyway, having said on that, I've beaten on the point long enough, uh, hopefully talked long enough, but, but entertained you. Uh, that's my goal here. And uh, hopefully you enjoyed watching this deck in action. Keep what I said in mind about the multiplayer scenario. I will keep you up to date with changes. And uh, thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.